May the blessings of Allah be upon you all and welcome to this third panel discussion of this conference. Our panel discussion was uh, on consaginous marriage, which we chose a title for first. The previous title was Perspective of Sharia and Society and Bioethics, but uh, we, uh, as you have seen in the program, we are still within the bounds of uh, the family and the uh, founding block in starting any family is choosing a partner for your, for the rest of your life, a husband or a wife. And this has been the focus here has always been on on, uh, on uh, choosing who we hope and assume will be the best person that we want to spend the rest of our lives with. And there is a hadith by the Prophet uh, which advises people of making or... Uh, making the right choices or trying to do so. And there is a number of considerations here, of course, and different, it's like religion, for example. And religion tells us that you can marry this man or this woman, or you are not. For example, in Islam, a woman is not allowed to marry a non-Muslim, whereas a um, Muslim man is allowed to marry a woman who belongs to one of the other two religions, Christianity or Judaism, people of the book. Or there can be demographic reasons, like in some GCC countries, a marriage with a non-citizen, a non-GCC citizen, requires a special permit from the authorities. But uh, in the recent past, when we noticed that uh, science and uh, biology started playing a role in this through some tests that can be done before marriage, and the question of... Uh, genetics and dominant and recessive genes, etc., uh, are now featuring in the debate and play a role in determining who the perfect or best partner is. Of course, there are other considerations uh, uh, like um, social, political, geographical, tribal, etc. We will try and shed light on these uh, uh, issues and at the same time we want to pose some central pivotal questions which will raise the level of debate into a methodological level which can come up with some answers like for example determining uh, to what extent the principle of interest and harm is applicable or on what basis can ethical or legal uh, sharia con considerations can be taken into account. We will take this uh, into consideration. Some of these issues may sound like uh, a bit philosophical, but nonetheless, they are, have a central role to play in our discussion with us. We have Dr. Fuad Shaban. You have your bi the biography. I think you have Dr. Tawfiq bin Amran. Unfortunately, uh, is taken ill, and we pray to God to grant him a speedy recovery. And we thank Dr. Fuad Shaban who has kindly uh, given us his time, valuable time, to take the place. And although at a very short notice, he decided to come and join us. And Dr. Abdul Haq Hamish, 
First, I present Dr. Fuad bin Shaban. I will uh, the introduction will be in English. Dr. Fuad bin Shaban graduated from Baghdad College of Medicine and became involved in the field of preventive medicine. He obtained his Master of Science and PhD in Public Health and Occupational Medicine from the UK, from the United Kingdom. He held many different positions as scientist working in academic research and as associate professor in occupational medicine and public health. He was also a planner and advisor in different medical institutions, including the Iraqi Ministry of Health. Um, uh, prior to joining the Shafalah Medical uh, Genetic Center here in Qatar, he was research program manager and senior research coordinator in the Washington Hospital Center in association with John Hopkins University uh, Hospital. He was head of research at the Shafalah Medical Genetic Center, where he was involved in setting up research policies and regulations, as well as the establishment of the Institutional Review Board, the IRV of the QBRI. So you see that he is also not very far from the field of uh, bioethics and medical ethics. Um, <clears throat> now Dr. Shaban works as a senior scientist at QBRI Neurological Disorder Research Center here in Doha. Uh, his research interests lie in the epidemiology of genetic diseases and particularly in autism spectrum disorder. He is involved in two research projects funded by the Qatar National Research Fund, uh, one in collaboration with the University College of London in the UK, where he investigates the genomics, anthropology, and social impact of genetic knowledge in Qatar. The second project entitled Prevalence of Autism Spectrum Disorder in Qatar in collaboration, in collaboration with Oregon Health and Science, Science University and the Cleveland uh, Clinic in um, the USA. Uh, so <clears throat> we are very happy in having him here on board in this panel. The second guest, the second guest, the second speaker, Dr. Abdul Haq Hamish. He obtained his PhD from Umm Al Qura University in Mecca in Saudi Arabia, and uh, uh, he. This was uh, on the book of Qadi Abdul Wahab Al Baghdadi. He taught. Uh, at the Mohammed bin Saud uh, University branch in Washington and Sharjah University. And now he is a lecturer at Hamad bin Khalifa University and coordinates uh, the contemporary fiqh program. He has numerous uh, publications to his name, like uh, Caring for People with Special Needs in Islam, and other peer-reviewed researchers. I welcome both our panelists, and we start with Dr. Fuad Shaban. I have my, okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it's, it's better to be closer here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Muhammad, very much for the introduction. Bismillah Consanguinity, of course, the term is co of consanguinity is used to describe the relationship between couples who share at least one common ancestor. Uh, while consanguinous marriages uh, refers to a union between biologically uh, related individuals in clinical genetics, a consanguinous marriage means union between couples who are related as second cousins or closer. Um, so consanguinous marriage have been practiced since early existence of modern humans. Uh, communities with, until now, consanguinity is widely spread in uh, many areas in the world, especially in the Arab world and the Islamic world. Uh, in the Middle East, it's, it's not only consanguinity, uh, which is important here, but also endogamy, uh, which means that it's selecting marriages 
partners from within a particular group over generation. And this practice of consanguinity has been proposed as a contributor to the presence of many health problems, as we are going to see in the following uh, slides. Uh, across the Middle East, of course, the rates of consanguinity range in most societies from 20 to 55 percent. It depends whether the uh, uh, consanguineous marriage between the first cousin or the uh, other uh, uh, relatives. And uh, the main areas which shows higher uh, figures of consanguinities, as we see here, I mean, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Iran, Qatar, and actually Jordan, Kuwait, even in the Palestinian regions. I mean, it's all over the area. And if we have a look at the map, which shows that the, um, here it shows the areas with the highly consanguineous, 50 and above, it shows here the Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Sudan, also Pakistan, and there are some other countries, the range is between 40 to 49, and so on and so forth. This uh, slide shows the, uh, uh, in a study, uh, it shows the first uh, degree of, uh, or, or first cousin uh, consanguinity rates uh, between uh, the uh, GCC areas and some other Arab countries. And it shows here in Qatar, it's around 27 to 35 percent. Uh, Sudan is a little bit higher. And the issue is that in certain uh, countries, especially Arab countries, the consanguinity rates is declining. While in other areas like the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Iran, Yemen, it's still on the rise. Now, if we look at the consanguinity from the medical point of view, what's the effect of consanguineous marriages on the health of the population in general? Uh, if you see the slides, it shows um, this is the first a grandfather who's one of them is a carrier of a defective gene, if we can say so. And when they get they got married, they will have two carriers of the same genes. And if the first cousins remarry, we we will get a, a, a real case of that disease. And I will show it make it closer to you. Uh, for instance, <clears throat> in these cases, these are two carriers who are cousins, first degree cousins. Uh, when they got married, we will get 25% of the offspring going to be affected by that disorder or a disease, while 50% of the offspring going to be carriers. And only 25% going to be free of that defective genes. So if we look at it this way, I mean, what's going to happen if there is going to be more remarrying or more consanguineous marriages in between the uh, uh, ancestry? So this means that this is going to amplify more and more. Of course, this is a true for uh, uh, mainly the uh, recessive, we call it the autosomal recessive defects or gene defects or diseases or disorders. But it doesn't have uh, more effects on other diseases. The other important issue, uh, these disorders or the effect of consanguinity on, on diseases is mainly for the monogenetic disorders. Because as you know, there are certain diseases 
which is considered to be a multifactorial. It needs more than uh, defects in more than a gene to uh, to manifest itself as a disease. And I can give you an example, for instance, autism, since I'm working on the, this issue. Uh, so these diseases, sometimes the multifactorial diseases, uh, which has uh, the effect of environmental factors together with the genetic factors, those diseases, we cannot consider them as a hereditary diseases, which means that it's not going to be inherited mainly from father to sons, etc. Uh, so, so we need to uh, differentiate between hereditary diseases, which means that there are certain genetic effects, mainly it affects a mutation in a single gene. These diseases could be inherited, and these are especially, if it's a, an autosomal recessive, it's going to be uh, uh, the magnitude or, or the rate going to increase by consanguinity. The, there are certain congenital uh, diseases or genetic diseases who are not hereditary, which means that the father or grandfather, uh, he has no such uh, signs and symptoms of that disease. But what happened, even when you look at it from the genetic part, you do the test, he has nothing to do, uh, no abnormal genes. But during the process, there will be what we call it a mutation in certain genes, and that mutations will be transcribed as a disease in the offspring. So, so certain genetic diseases, they are not hereditary by, the, by this means. Uh, also, sometimes we have congenital diseases and genetic diseases. Uh, of course, congenital diseases mean, means that the diseases which manifest itself uh, immediately after birth, while, and it should be a genetic, I mean, all congenital, uh, uh, all Hereditary diseases are genetic diseases. Uh, all gen uh, 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 congenital diseases is not uh, necessarily a hereditary one, but we call them sometimes congenital when it manifests itself immediately after birth, because there are certain changes. For instance, uh, during uh, the pregnancy, if the mother is affected by certain viral disease like German measles. We expect that the infant's going to have certain congenital abnormalities. So this is not inherited, or the genes are not affected. Anyhow, now, uh, what's the effect of consanguinity on the rate of inheritance of certain diseases. Uh, of course, congenital diseases or genetic disorders is a very common, especially in societies where the infant mortality rate from other diseases, uh, like infectious diseases, are declining. Because, for instance, 20, 30 years ago, the main bulk of the mortality of the a newborn during the first year of life, infection, diarrhea, some other uh, diseases. So by the vaccination and the other uh, advancements in medicine, now that rate or is declining. So what's now it's a prominent is the con genetic disease is going to be more prominent. So the rate of the genetic diseases usually in the population range between two to three, but among consanguineous marriages, it's going to rise up almost double the background rate, which is 4 to 6 percent. Comparing these rates between a consanguineous uh, community or society with other societies, we could see here uh, the difference. For instance, it's more than 70 percent of uh, birth defects are registered among consanguineous communities compared to around 52 per, uh, per, per uh, 1,000. So it's around the 30% is more uh, among consanguineous communities. 
these are the main uh, uh, most common genetic disorders which we could of course there are uh, they are in thousands but these are the most common disorders and if we could see for instance the color blindness the uh, hemophilia these are what we call it the x linked diseases diseases which uh, the mother will work as a carrier it affects the x chromosome uh, and the other for instance we have the sickle cell disease and phenylketonuria uh, cystic fibrosis these are an examples of the autosomal recessive sickle cell anemia etc if we look at this uh, table uh, uh, the, uh, regarding the disability statistics in Qatar done in 2010, uh, we could see accidents uh, amount to 387. These are among Qataris and compared to non-Qataris. Uh, the pathological, which means diseases induced uh, 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 disease, uh, I mean, handicap, and the congenital and the hereditary. If we see, in uh, to compare these figures between Qataris and non-Qataris residing in Qatar, we could see there is an increase or a difference between 30 percent. This, to me, because as you know, the non-Qataris uh, residing in Qatar. Uh, most of them, they are Muslims, Arabs, so consanguinity rate, it's almost uh, similar or a little bit lower than the Qataris. And this will um, uh, explain the difference between the, uh, these, uh, uh, the prevalence of these diseases between Qataris and non-Qataris residing here. Uh, these are the most common single gene disorders. I'm mentioning that because these are, uh, these could be prevented by doing certain screening or test on those diseases. Among them, of course, the hemoglobin, uh, hemoglobinopathies, uh, thalassemia and sickle cell anemia. They are very common in this region, not only here in Qatar, but in the whole Middle East. Uh, uh, we have of course, early detection of cystic fibrosis also, there are many cases here in Qatar, and it's an autosomal recessive uh, disease. Congenital adrenal hyperplasia, deaf, uh, mute, and deficiency. Uh, of course, these diseases, we can detect them because they are uh, monogenetic. Uh, now, the premarital screening. Premarital screening, there is a law here in Qatar, that uh, the marriage is, okay, uh, everybody need to do that screening before marriage. But sometimes it give a false, com I mean, uh, uh, people, if you say, okay, uh, there is no harm of getting married to my cousin or my first cousin because I'm going to do the premarital screening and it's going to show if there is a risk of having uh, certain abnormalities. Actually, this is not uh, true. It will give uh, a false confidence that, okay, nothing gonna happen because we are not going to look for all the diseases during that screening. These are the main uh, uh, diseases looked at in the screening. Mainly sickle cell and anemia, uh, thalassemia, hemophilia, if there is a, a family history of hemophilia. Uh, HIV, syphilis, hepatitis B, and C. Uh, <clears throat> the most important things in, in this regard is the counseling. For instance, if we, uh, a cousin, uh, marriage, before getting married, we, they need to have a counseling, a history of these going to be asked, birth defects, early hearing impairment in the, in both families and vision impairment, mental uh, retardation, developmental, etc. And now I'm going to talk a few minutes about the project that 
being done here in Qatar, and it's called arranging marriages, uh, negotiating risk, uh, genetics and society in Qatar. Actually, we did uh, interview around f uh, about 45 families with uh, uh, special needs, children affected, some of them with intellectual disability, some of them with uh, autism and other uh, diseases. And the questionnaires is to have an idea about what kind of genetic knowledge or uh, in those families and to see whether they are consanguineous or not, etc. And the interesting things that uh, among the interviews, uh, we have some quotations, for instance, this quotation from a lady, Mrs. F. She said regarding the consanguineous marriages, uh, she could, I think it strengthened the family uh, relationship and no matter what, the girl would still be among her family. I know some other couples are, uh, who are not related, but they are fam their family relationship is good. Uh, and this lady actually is, uh, uh, she came from a large Bedouin tribe known to favor consanguineous marriages and many uh, 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 congenital abnormalities and diseases among that uh, family. Uh, of course, the other issue that most of the participants, the, whether the fathers or the mothers, they didn't attribute the, <coughs> those diseases to genetic factors. Some of them, they say it's an evil eye, etc. So some of them, they know uh, uh, genetics has something to do with those diseases affected their offspring, and consanguinity has something to do with that. And the conclusion that, of course, you see, most of the families, they favor their daughter to be married within the family. Uh, in order, they think that she will be more secure, she will be among her family, etc. But nowadays, what we are... Oh, sorry. I need to go back. Yeah. Uh, now, the younger generation attitude is a little bit changing. So some of them, they do discuss or argue that they will discuss this issue with their families and uh, now they, they know what's the problem about and they are trying to, you know, get a bit. So in the, maybe in the near future, we might see some decline in the consanguinity rate. Thank you very much. In the name of God, the most merciful, the most compassionate, may the blessings of Allah be upon his messenger and all his descendants and followers until the day of judgment. Uh, I'll focus on trying to establish if there is a relationship between consanguineous marriages and genetic disorders and uh, perspective of fiqh or jurisprudence. We have a number of aims for this research. We try to answer uh, the following or some of the following questions. What are the negative consequences of consanguineous marriages? Where does uh, Sharia or fiqh stand? As uh, marrying outside uh, families and blood relations a uh, sunnah that should be followed and therefore can we consequently say that consanguineous marriage is something which is not favored so, but w and what should be the ref reference here is it sharia is it genetics is it uh, societal norms and social traditions and how can we uh, eventually uh, reconciliate between these two different perspectives or place one before the other, the methodology uh, in which we will 
First of all, we will try and understand consanguineous marriage. What does it mean as a concept, its history, its uh, causes, its consequences, and secondly, a uh, medical point of view, and thirdly, the Sharia ah and jurists' point of view, and we try and say, is marrying outside the blood relations a sunnah that should be followed, and so on and so forth. We also allude to the opinion that uh, if conclusively determined that consanguineous marriage can cause harm, should it be banned? In that case, from the point of view of Sharia, the concept of consanguineous marriage is the type of marriage between two people who are blood-related, like marrying a man marrying his first cousin on his mother's side or his father's side. And it is a social phenomena that human societies have known throughout history. And it is prevalent in Arab societies. It is part and parcel of the traditions that see that a young man is more entitled than others to marry his cousin on his mother's side or his father's side. And in the Orient, this has been even more prevalent for different reasons, which can be summarized as follows. First of all, the decision exclusively being in the hands of the father and sometimes the mother and the belief that uh, consanguineous marriages increases relations and ties and the idea that uh, a relative will better care for his wife and if she is related to him than a stranger and also to protect the uh, properties of the family and the wealth of the family within the family and, and questions related to inheritance and also because dowries are so high nowadays maybe marrying into, in, into the family can reduce costs to ask for the consequences whether negative or positive Opinions differ and then can mainly be divided into two. One, pos one position which calls for not allowing this kind of marriages because it can cause harm to both the family and society at large. And of course, each camp has its own evidence in support of their position. The second position doesn't see any harm in that. On the contrary, it emphasizes on the positive sides on the immediate family and society at large. In Islam, marriage uh, is an important uh, tie and wedlock is one of the most important ties in uh, humanity that religion has called for because a successful marriage will fulfill the noble uh, uh, the, the noble objectives like uh, having families on the right basis and increasing social ties and societal ties and increasing cohesion in society and also stab starting a happy family. Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, said the Prophet Sallallahu said, said, choose uh, your partners because uh, what is uh, in the bones can appear in the flesh or sort of speak. In the second part of my presentation, I discussed the medical perspective for all of this and as a result of the advances achieved in the field of genetics and genetic sciences, uh, uh, some important uh, 
conclusions uh, uh, are better understood now compared to previous. Please uh, try not to focus so much on these details. We don't have time. Now we move to the to the Sharia point of view, which is uh, at the center of this um, paper. Dr. Muhammad Shankiti posed a, 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 a question and whether Islam has banned the marriage and to, with 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 mothers with nieces and nephews etc because this is banned categorically as is evident in the Quran when Allah Almighty says clearly that marriages with mothers and uh, aunts and aunties on the mother's side or the paternal maternal aunts and etc uh, to the rest of this uh, verse, which clearly state that that is completely banned, uh, and also the wives of your sons, and uh, also marrying sisters at the same time. This kind of marriage has been banned in Islam, and... Uh, of course, this is the part which is banned, and Ibn Baz, uh, the late Ibn Baz from Saudi Arabia, says the wisdom behind this is that uh, God Almighty has uh, not allowed the marriage with some relatives and allowed for some, and uh, this was uh, issued in Islam to further ties and cooperation and enhance societies and uh, because uh, with certain degrees of uh, relations and, and also marrying daughters and mothers and God Almighty or God who is an infinite wisdom has uh, decided this some which are available to us and some and uh, because uh, if uh, this was not uh, then so then would have caused harm. An important question here in this regard is has the Prophet وسلم, said something to the effect that he advised marrying non relations and marrying outside families and brother relations and if there is such uh, traditions how do uh, scholars uh, there are four such uh, traditions one which says uh, to choose your wives uh, outside your brother relations the second one uh, also advises to marry outside blood relations. The third one says uh, 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 to same effect in the four uh, traditions and uh, uh, the scholars decided that all these uh, all these four traditions are false ones and they are attributed wrongly and there is nothing which has been proven to be authentic. In fact, nothing has been proven to be authentically attributed to the Prophet because, after all, how can God say something and then the Prophet will ban it? And some scholars say that uh, I have not come across anything that can testify to the authenticity of these uh, of this hadith, so it is evident then that uh, the Prophet has not said anything, and if 
if there is anything which can be authentic here, in fact, it's what is attributed to Umar ibn al-Khattab and not the Prophet ﷺ, when the story of uh, people gathered with uh, with uh, uh, Umar and a certain family said to him that they had uh, illnesses or disorders appearing in their family, so he advised them to marry outside the family. So what do the scholars say when it comes to consanguineous marriages? Uh, or the opinion differs amongst... Uh, the, in fact, the scholars all agree that this is permissible, but they differed on the extent of permissibility. The Shafi'is and the Hanbalis in their books uh, 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 say it's uh, it's not uh, desirable. Uh, the 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 first uh, camp which do not favor it, they do not say it's not permissible, but they say it's not favored in their opinion. Uh, relied on the four hadiths that we proved that they are not authentic and they are falsehoods attributed to the Prophet. Or sometimes that in case of uh, uh, divorce, this can cause a disconnection in the uh, family ties and tribal ties. They also said that uh, marrying, marrying outside the family relations scope is, uh, can lead to a wider circle of ties and the society in the end will be more cohesive because different parts and uh, uh, increase through marriages. They also use some medical opinion which says that repeated inbred uh, marriages will end up in uh, genetical disorders or disorders. Also, it is uh, attributed, attributed to Imam Shafi'i that uh, some people used to say that uh, the the possibility of uh, certain diseases occurring in the offspring is increased in consanguineous marriages. The second theme, which make it permissible, of course. Uh, some jurists say that they rely on the verse number three in the Surah An-Nisa. Uh, agree with this opinion and the fact that the Prophet's own daughter uh, Fatima married her first cousin Ali and some Shafi'i jurists went against the wisdom of their own school of thought and the Subki, he is a Shafi'i, he belongs to the Shafi'i school of thought he says that he disagrees with marrying uh, outside the family. He says there is no proof testifying to that, and he uses the marriage of the Prophet's own daughter to her cousin as evidence that this is the right way. As for the, the third uh, camp, and they say it is permissible and... Uh, they raised the degree of permissibility to that of a nadb. The contemporary jurists say, like Ibn Baz, for example, when somebody approached him with the so-called hadith of the Prophet, which called for marrying outside the family, and uh, uh, the late Shaykh said this uh, this hadith is non-existent and it's false and marrying your relatives consanguineous marriage is better because after all the prophet married his daughters into their cousins some jurists said uh, 
In fact, people have a choice. If they, if a man wants to marry his cousins, then so be it, or marries outside, then there is no harm. As for the people who claim that marrying outside the family is, has no evidence, says uh, marrying relatives has its advantages, and marrying, if, but he, if the man sees that his interests are fulfilled in marrying a stranger, then that should be his choice. And some jurists, contemporary jurists, uh, say that if it was proven that uh, genetic disorders are likely to occur in the case of uh, consanguineous marriages, then in, on that condition, then uh, consanguineous marriages should be avoided. And uh, in this case, it's better to marry someone who's not a relative uh, so that the man can avoid transmitting these diseases into his future generations. But if, however, the the relatives are, have no signs of showing any hereditary diseases, then marrying relatives can be better. Uh, also, the Dr. Nasser Farid Wasl, the former mufti of uh, Egypt, says that marrying uh, consanguineous marriages, if proven conclusively, can lead to uh, hereditary diseases that should not be allowed. But for this, conclusive evidence has to be present in case of congenital diseases or defects appearing. In that case, this will not be haram or unlawful, and the contract of marriage will be null and void not because of not fulfilling the conditions, but according to the prophets saying that uh, harm should be avoided, uh, self-inflicted, and uh, uh, no harm uh, in infliction of, uh, of them. Uh, and in any case, uh, we must uh, judge each case in its uh, own merit. Uh, the Sharia does not order us, nor does it ban us from this, so that each case should be uh, del deliberated and carefully considered in its own merit. Sometimes it's marrying a relative is better than it should be followed, and uh, vice versa, and the best use we can use from the, the what the jurist said, that we should not exaggerate to the extent that they never marry outside the family or inside it. For this reason, Umar ibn al-Khattab said, this family of al Saab that did not marry only they married exclusively within the family, he advised them to go beyond that. So therefore, neither is, uh, should be followed exclusively. People should choose best to what fulfills their interests in their lives and their religion. And if there is medical evidence which prove the likelihood of hereditary diseases and congenital disorders, then in that case, marriage should not go ahead, especially when it's repeated and because Muslims are ordered to take these things into consideration, like the pre-marriage tests, because this can save the family from... The One more minute, please. Of course... Uh, uh, protecting your progeny is a prime uh, objective of the Sharia, like what Imam al-Ghazali has said. And also, uh, scholars favor the idea of medical tests. This will, uh, with this, 
can mean that uh, warding of harm before it takes place is better than mitigating its uh, results and consequences. So therefore, minimizing births uh, with uh, the likelihood of congenital and hereditary diseases will be much better to be avoided from the start than having to deal with it when the children are born, than having to go through life providing them. Uh, there is a number of recommendations I'll mention. Them. First of all, I recommend to all young men and women to go through the medical test before marriage. Also, raise awareness amongst families of the importance of this medical test. And also, leaders in society, the media, decision makers have the responsibility of raising awareness of this and raise awareness in hereditary diseases. I thank you for your kind attention. Well, may Allah's blessings be upon you all.